It is April 1945, and the end of the war in Europe is in sight. German ambitions in Europe and the rest of the world have been quashed by Allied efforts through blood, sweat, tears, cold determination and ingenuity, cleverness and resourcefulness. And that's what we will talk about today. When bright minds equipped with dwindling resources were set to do the nearly impossible. We will talk about proximity fuses. Hello darlings, and welcome back to another episode of Spice and Ties. My name is Astrid Deinhardt. And I'm Anna Deinhardt. Let us begin. A proximity fuse is a fuse which detonates a shell or other projectile charge when in close proximity to a target. Indy recently clarified how these were important to the Allied war effort in an Out of the Foxholes episode. But how did the Allies get their hands on these wonder weapons? And what are they really? This episode about espionage is unusual. As it contains no espionage, the proximity fuse was the result of the opposite, sharing sensitive information between the US and Great Britain before they were allies, even before the US entered the war. Perhaps one of the several signs that the US entry into World War II was decided, or at least probable, long before Pearl Harbor. Okay, so the idea of such a fuse had been floating around since the end of World War I. Given the size of electronics at the time, it remained just that, an idea. But the interwar years, technology had advanced and electronics had become more capable and smaller than ever. By the middle of the 30s, with the Allies beginning rearmament in earnest military projects received renewed attention and funding, and proximity fuses were discussed in earnest. On the British side, amongst many others, the TRE, or Telecommunications Research Establishment, began work in 1935 to assess and develop radar technology. It was led by Henry Tizard, chemist, inventor and president and rector of the Imperial College London. A group of four TRE scientists first conceived the idea of using radar to create a proximity fuse. By summer 1940, after France had fallen, the Brits and Tizard knew that if they wanted to see proximity fuse equipped shells, not to mention their many other projects in action, they needed help. As a result, in August 1940, the Tizard mission headed to the United States of America. There, they met with Benava Bush, a famous US scientist who had overseen investigations of cosmic rays, gaseous rocks, the evolution of early humankind and the rotation of the galaxy. He, keeping a close eye on developments in Germany, specifically the Luftwaffe, had been calling for more money in aeronautics. But his previous pleas had fallen on uh, deaf ears when he was vice chairman of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, the predecessor to NASA. But now, as chairman, he had the ear of Roosevelt. He convinced the president that the U.S. needed a concentrated research effort under the president's direct supervision. Shortly after, the National Defense Research Committee, NDRC, was established, with Bush becoming its chairman. Tezard's approach to the mission was, shall we say, unique. And Churchill himself initially vehemently opposed to it. In 1940, many in the US Congress still preached neutrality, which meant that there were many barriers to open military cooperation. Tizard saw this and decided the best way forward was to just reveal their hand, plainly giving the Americans their research. This way, the productive capabilities of the sleeping giant could be used quickly, sidestepping any hurdles and negotiations about military cooperation and the exchange of secrets. Put this way, even Churchill began to see the merits of the plan and gave his blessing. 
So, when Tizard and Bush first met on the 31st of August 1940, the stars were aligned. Churchill and Roosevelt were on board and everyone was aware what threat the Nazis and their Luftwaffe presented. The British research notes were handed over. Just weeks before, on August the 17th, the Americans had begun research on their own proximity fuse. For the job, they recruited Merle Tooth, a renowned atom smasher who had recently completed one of the most advanced particle accelerators in the world. He and his team began their work under NDRC Division A, known as Section T. Yes, or Section 2, as Tuve himself referred to it. The main benefactor of the project was the US Navy, themselves painfully aware that the air defenses were inadequate. This was not because they had inadequate guns or support targeting technology, but simply because the chance of hitting an enemy plane with conventional fuses was minimal. Naval gunners manually set fuses on explosive rounds. First, you had to calculate with telescopes where an airplane might be in, say 15 seconds, measuring height, bearing and range. Fire the shell an instant too early or too late and even if you missed your aim by only a foot, the round would be thousands of feet off. Shells had to explode within a window of one fortieth of a second. No wonder it took thousands of rounds to knock one bird out of the sky. No wonder every Akagama dreamed of a shell that could automatically explode near a target. Section T set out to change this. But, as we mentioned earlier, it had to do so without an abundance of supplies. For example, the team initially had to use an improvised self-made gun and shell cartridges made out of pipes. While this did slow the process, it did not make them give up. At first, four out of many different versions of the proximity fuse were seriously discussed. You could design a photoelectric fuse that went off with a change in light. Or you might build a listening device to explode near the sound of an airplane propeller. Or you could make a fuse using radio waves. You might even design a sensor to trigger near an airplane's low intensity magnetic field. In any case, for any of the proposed approaches, one thing was needed, a small enough vacuum tube serving as a transistor, something that could reliably control an electric current. They found a suitable candidate in an unexpected device, a hearing aid. There too, the tubes needed to be small. And after initial testing, enough of them survived being fired to begin with more tests. It did not take long before two of the four possible mechanisms behind the fuses were discarded. For one, the scientists quickly realized that the listening shell was not going to work. The reason behind this is quite simple. Imagining being fired out the barrel of an AA gun and after a defeating a national explosion that might very well burst your eardrums, you slice through the air at upwards of 1700 feet or 512 meters, that is, per second towards enemy aircraft. Then, after somewhere between 5 to 10 seconds, somebody shouts at you over the noise of the air rushing by Can you hear the enemy plane? <laughs> Similarly, the microphones proved incapable of withstanding the forces exerted upon them and not sensitive enough to distinguish the sound of an engine over the cacophony of other sounds in the background. Tooth went so far as to call this attempt a flying toilet bowl. <laughs> The, the magnetic fuse also proved non-feasible. The electronics were too complex and not advanced enough to reliably detect the small magnetic field on an airplane. The other two proposals, the light-sensitive and radar-based fuses, were pursued with more vigor and roughly one year after the project had begun, in the summer of 42, both were put to the test. Once more, 
the team quickly realized which one was promising and which was not. During the test, the light sensing fuses had to be fired away from the sun, as otherwise glare could lead to premature detonation. Since you can't make the enemy reliably choose a suitable angle of attack, that was a problem. Beyond that, different weather conditions necessitated different lens sizes, and perhaps the biggest problem was that the enemy could also attack at night, making these fuses rather useless. So then. The radar fuse it was. The tubes continued to be an ongoing concern for the scientists as they continued to break when fired. To help Ray Mindlin, associate professor of the University of Columbia, was inducted in the team. He revised the tube design. But even after these improvements, only one out of ten fuses lit in tests. This was below the Navy's demanded a success rate of at least 50% before putting the fuses in serial production. Production was another area which troubled the team. As any half-decent scientist can tell you, the key of experimentation is a controlled environment. You control for or eliminate any variables but one. And then you know whether and how changing said variables affect your experiment. However, T-section had to work with normal run-of-the-mill manufacturers who couldn't even know what they were building. Hence, establishing the consistency of the manufacturing process proved problematic. But just like the other hurdles put in their path, the team eventually overcame them. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, the urgency of the project became a burden on the team and Toof, who reportedly ran around in the office chain smoking in order to cope. In any case, by January 1942, the results of a new test drone came in. Successful detonation rate, 52%. Everything was starting to look up. Tests against moving targets followed suit and once more the fuse worked within the desired parameters. However, one thing Section T was not equipped for was the opposition from leading Navy men like Admiral Ernest King, who had a strong distrust towards the new technology and discouraged the crew from adopting it. When Tove personally met President Roosevelt on New Year's Eve in 1943, this final hurdle was removed. The new fuses soon got the chance to show their capabilities. On January 5, 1943, the US Navy cruiser Helena came under attack from Japanese bombers just a few miles off the islands of Guadalcanal. While the machine guns immediately began slinging lead at the sky, they did so to little effect. But one 5-inch gun crew was prepared in quickly loaded shells equipped with the new proximity fuse. Helena's starboard gun crew fired 80 rounds at the Raiders. Within 15 seconds, a single burst of shrapnel exploded very close to a bomber, obscuring it from view, ripping the fuselage and sending the plane billowing with smoke tumbling from the sky, along with the pilot and the gunner. This was the best sail pitch T-section could hope for, and soon the shells spread amongst the US Pacific Fleet. To summarize, throughout 1943 only 25% of the shells fired from US Navy ships at incoming aircraft were from T-section. Nevertheless, they were responsible for 51% of kills, a 3 to 1 round per bird advantage over the normal shells. 80 rounds per kill, that's a ratio previous AA gun crews did not dare dream of. Even the Germans with the infamous Flag 88 only managed an average of 3,343 rounds of heavy and 4,940 rounds of light ammunition to shoot down an Allied bomber from 1939 to 1945. And the success story of the new fuse had only just begun. One fear remained, however. What if a shell failed to detonate and fell into enemy hands? 
Because of that reason, for the time being, the fuses could only be used where they would not fall into enemy hands, over the ocean, for example. But even with these limitations, the new fuses proved their metal once more against the Wunderwaffe V1. In the first two weeks of the siege, the Allies estimated that 1,585 drones were launched and that over 1,100 successfully crossed the channel. Royal Air Force pilots managed to shoot down only 350 of them. General Pals Ag -Ag gunners downed a mere 142. The balloons caught a piddling 33. In contrast, just two months later, in August 44, equipped with a further iteration of the new fuse, AA batteries set up along the coast in Dover managed a ration of eight rounds per bomb. It was 50 times better than the old ordinary fuses, giving Veneva Bush the moniker, the general of physics. The only problem that remained was that sometimes a truly unfortunate seagull would set off the shells mid-flight. Or the puss. Oh, oh. oh baby. <laughs> Anyway, soon the usage in normal artillery operations was also discussed. In December 1944, just after the Germans had begun their Arden offensive, Tuf came forward and claimed that the Germans would need roughly 20 months to reverse engineer the fuse and then another half a year or more to get it to mass production. Perhaps it was worth trying. And try they did. You see, a problem with the normal high explosive artillery shells was that they detonated after contact with the ground, wasting valuable energy and shrapnel to plow the ground rather than bound enemy troops. A defect not suffered by the new fuses. Because of their wider area of effect, the new fuses were especially useful when attacking the troops in the open when they thought that the cover of fog would help them. Moreover, snipers were eliminated with precise hits, shells exploding perfectly above the rooftops of their hideouts. Near the Belgian city of Loutrebois, a German reconnaissance platoon was hit with a barrage and lost half its men. By April 1945, the shell was used by US and British Army and Navy. All in all, it is estimated that the smart fuses shortened the war in the Pacific by a year, saved many thousands of British lives and won the Battle of the Bulge. This smart fuse is amongst the first in a long line of technologies which still dictate today's aerial warfare. Like homing missiles, not to mention their nowadays self-setting airburst shells are part of any army's artillery munition depots. This mm. is another example of how, given the right motivation, a few bright and clever individuals, even with little resources, can truly change the outcome of a continent-spanning, multi-year-long conflict. While today we may marvel at T-section, and the pioneers of this technology, it is important to remember that above one thing, we became better at killing as a result. If you would like to know more about espionage operations throughout the Second World War, check out our entire Spies and Ties videos, for example. Do you know about a secret Nazi U-boat mission? to New York. Hmm? Intrigued? Go check it out here. To get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and I will see you next time.